In the late 60s, three television shows exploited the ability of film technology to approximate magic. Those shows were Bewitched, I Dream of Jeannie, and The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. This third show is less well known, but much more interesting. Oh, come on now, I'm in no mood for games. Captain Greg. Good morning, madam. Would you have some lemon with your tea? Actress Hope Lang won two Best Actress Emmys for her portrayal of Mrs. Muir, twice beating out Elizabeth Montgomery of Bewitched. But the show was canceled after only two years. Is it possible that the ghost in Mrs. Muir was telling us too much? The show was developed by Jean Holloway from Josephine Leslie's novel of the same name. Holloway was a radio, film, and television writer since the 1930s, and her father, Arthur Casey, had been an official with the U.S. Department of Justice. The Justice Department houses a section involving admiralty litigation in its civil division. The show, as developed and often written by Holloway, quietly divulges several little-known facts regarding the legal jurisdiction of admiralty. We can only speculate, but it's possible Holloway may have learned these secrets from her father's work in the Department of Justice and shared them here either as an act of rebellion or disclosure. The central symbol of the ghost in Mrs. Muir was a ship's telescope pointing out to sea from the master bedroom of a place called Gull Cottage. In the 1800s, Gull Cottage had been the home of the seafaring captain Daniel Gregg. His telescope makes for the perfect symbol signifying that the audience will be shown something if that audience has the eyes to see. Admiralty law is defined in the Bouvier 1856 edition as a jurisdiction relating to the sea. We might logically assume this separates it from the jurisdiction of the land but this 60s sitcom was revealing the secret that much of what takes place on land falls under the legal jurisdiction of the sea. In the show, the central character, Captain Daniel Gregg, is dead. He's a ghost who died a century earlier, and he represents seamen of the past. For centuries, sailors assumed lost at sea were often declared dead. The Sesta K. V. Act, passed by British Parliament in 1666, allowed the British government to declare an absent man legally dead so as to evict the dead landowner from his land. As such, the Sesta K. V. Act became one way for the controllers to seize land, not by force, but via the legal system. Though originally a British law, Sesta KV is still very much a part of the modern legal system here in the U.S. and other countries as well. The spirit of this law remains intact today and allows the government to declare all its citizens legally dead in order to tax and in some cases seize their land. We know that Sesta KV was used to evict people from their land from the wording of Section 4 provided always that if any person or persons shall be evicted out of any lands, and afterwards if such person or persons upon whose life or lives such estate or estates depend shall return again from beyond the seas, or shall on proof in any action to be brought for recovery of the same, to be made appear to be living, then and from thenceforth the tenant or lessee who was outed of the same shall or may re-enter, repossess, have hold, and enjoy the said lands. Captain Gregg's last name gives us an important clue as to how a government can legally redefine a living being as a dead entity, even when not lost at sea. We can connect the captain's last name, Gregg, with the ultimate corporate body, the Catholic Church, and Pope Gregory XIII 
who implemented the Gregorian calendar. Before becoming Pope, Gregory XIII, whose real name was Ugo Boncompagni, was a professor of law and one of two judges of the civil court in the Campidoglio. He was also appointed Vice-Chancellor of the Italian province of Campania e Maritima, a name that translates to land and sea. In 1580, the legally educated Pope Gregory established the Corpus Juris Canonici, the body of canon law or church law. The Latin word corpus, meaning body, is the root of the word corporation, and the Catholic Church considered itself a corporate entity, meaning that all its members constituted one body. However, in law, a body of several people can attain corporate personhood. The corporate person has rights under the law, but is physically considered a dead entity, or immortal, as Cook wrote in 1613 in the case of Sutton's Hospital, also known as Charter House, a place I discussed in another video on underground jurisdictions. Legally redefining the natural living human body as a dead corporate person completely alters its legal rights and allows for much easier seizure of land. That Pope Gregory was known for seizing property throughout the states of the church to raise funds only adds to our understanding of how he viewed property ownership among the people. In The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, though Captain Gregg is a dead person, he still performs what economist Ludwig von Mises would call human action. The captain exists and acts in the world of the living he expresses preferences, asserts his will, makes purchases, and even takes out a loan. Since he is no longer a mortal human, we can assume that his power to act comes from his legal corporate status, as articulated by Lord Chief Justice Holt in 1690. Some say this, a corporation, is but a capacity, this is more, this is an entity, they have power to act. In the show, Captain Gregg was not lost at sea. He died in Gold Cottage on land, and there's a recurring theme that shows up in the storyline regarding whether Gold Cottage is a ship at sea or a house on land. So, you finally admit that you are lucky to be aboard my ship. Captain, ships are on water, houses are on land, and I'm standing on land. You are standing on my land, madam, and I am a man of the sea. Well, then why can't you tell water from land? It's a theme that suggests an important question. Are we living our physical lives on land while living our legal lives at sea? Captain Gregg's living descendant and legal beneficiary is his nephew, Claymore Gregg, played by Charles Nelson Riley. While the captain clearly represents the sea, Claymore's name is a reference to land, as clay is a type of soil, and a moor is a form of land. Claymore's portrayed in the show as stingy and corrupt, a man who would do anything to make a buck. He also holds many municipal offices in the town of Schooner Bay. Claymore, I'm not here to talk about Gull Cottage. I want to talk to you in your capacity as town clerk. Oh, certainly, Mrs. Mueller. Pardon me. Is there a justice of the peace? Oh, well, 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 yes. Who is he? Can we get hold of him? Oh, I suppose so. It's me. <laughs> you? Yes, you, 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 you see, a few dollars here, a few dollars there, it adds up. The whole idea of a history contest was my idea. I am the head of the Chamber of Commerce. Well, it's not about you, Claymore. It's about the celebration of the founding of Schooner Bay Grammar School. But, as chairman of the school board, <laughs> naturally I shall be featured. No, that's not my good side. <laughs> Please, gentlemen, let us get on with this, please. Nominations for the next president of the council in the upcoming election. I nominate the incumbent, Claymore Gregg. <laughs> Do I hear a second? Why second? Gentlemen, I don't believe there are any of you here who have suffered by following my judgment in these matters in the past. In fact, a number of you have benefited 
financially. <laughs> Need I say more? And as I said, I shall try to live up to your highest expectations as your Grand Admiral. Meeting a journal. <laughs> Admiral, are you? We'll see about that. <laughs> He's also Carolyn's landlord at Gull Cottage, having inherited the house from Captain Gregg. The term landlord goes back to feudal times and was originally derived from the concept of no land without a lord. This dictum was first expressed when William the Conqueror claimed all English land as belonging to him, and anyone holding land suddenly found it necessary to pay feudal obligations to the new king in order to keep their land. Claymore the public servant and landlord really represents the controllers, the cabal behind the debt-based monetary system and the corrupt legal system engaged in these ongoing land grabs. And in the pilot episode of the show, Claymore ironically cites the government's threat to seize Gull Cottage as the reason why he's now becoming a landlord. I've I, 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 I leased the house. <laughs> That's the only way I can meet the taxes. I'm doing it for you. If they seize the property, they'll tear the house down. Claymore, as Captain Gregg's nephew, is the legal beneficiary and landlord of the captain's property, and the two form an interlocking duality of land and sea. Mrs. Muir is a young widow who rents Gull Cottage to live there with her children and housekeeper. In the novel, Mrs. Muir's first name was Lucy, but Jean Holloway changed the name in the show to Carolyn. This could have been done for any number of reasons, but one meaning of the name Carolyn is free man. The surname of Muir is Scottish and means both moorland in Scottish and the sea in Scots Gaelic. Both names together could be suggesting that Carolyn is freely moving between the jurisdiction of the sea, the world of Captain Gregg, and the land, the world of Claymore. These three characters each represent a particular legal status. Claymore is a controller who's legally alive. Carolyn is a free woman who's legally alive. And Captain Gregg is a corporate dead entity, or straw man. In addition, these three characters loosely represent three forms of law. Carolyn, as a free woman on land, represents common law. Claymore, as the governmental controller on land, represents civil law. And Captain Gregg, as the dead seaman, represents admiralty law. Or more precisely, the victim of admiralty law. Common law is the form of law borrowed from England, which is different from civil law, an even earlier form of law borrowed from the Romans. Admiralty law is more of a conglomeration based on medieval English admiralty, the French rolls of Oleron, the Italian Amalfian laws, and late Roman or Rhodian sea law. These three forms of law, common, civil, and admiralty, are also portrayed by another set of characters in the episode of the show called Not So Faust. In this one, the devil puts Claymore on trial and his three judges are the pirate Blackbeard, Jesse James, and the Emperor Nero. So how do these laws differ? English common law is customary, based mostly on precedent or decisions from earlier cases. Civil law is not based on precedent, but instead on legislation and statute. Civil law is codified, meaning it's written down, as in the US Code. Common law may be written down, but it's not codified. And here in the US, civil law is more centralized at the federal level, while common law is less standardized and tried more on the state level. 
Where does admiralty law fit in? It's much more closely aligned with civil law, as admiralty law is statutory, codified, and under federal authority. When governments seek to implement greater levels of control over the people, Roman civil law is preferred. In contrast, common law was always meant to guarantee the rights of the people against either the monarchy or government. So when governments seek greater power, they must first weaken the common law barriers that exist. One way to circumvent common law is to utilize the jurisdiction of admiralty. In this episode, called The Spirit of the Law, Captain Greg ominously predicts that Carolyn, and presumably the audience, will learn something that will change their views on the legal system. Captain, I believe in the due process of law. You will change your mind, as I did. The episode opens with Mrs. Muir realizing there's a workman from the county in her front yard attempting to encroach on the land of Gull Cottage. Seven twelfths of our property? You can't do that! Oh, I, uh, I'm afraid I can, ma'am. See, the uh, county's got to put up a couple of towers here for what we call your high-tension wires. You know? oh, that would be a terrible eyesore. And besides, this is private property. Uh, yeah, well, it, it may be, but uh, you see, there's a thing called uh, eminent domain. See, that's the uh, government's right to do what it needs to do. It's all fair and legal, fair and legal. Well, it may be legal, but it, it certainly isn't fair. <laughs> well, as an old saying, lady, I love old sayings. I love a good old... Here's one. <laughs> you can't fight City Hall. Eminent domain is the ability of the government to legally take private property when it's deemed necessary for the public good. The concept, known in our Constitution as the Takings Clause, places the public good higher and more important than the best interest of any individual. Esteemed Magistrate, <laughs> the individual will always be in conflict with the group. <laughs> The individual and the group will always be in conflict. You just said that. Oh, did I? Well, it stands to be repeated, Your Honor. The individual and the group will, will always, always be in conflict. <laughs> the state frames the need for eminent domain as a struggle or tension between the group and the individual. But we should frame this tension as it really exists between the state and the individual, because the state is deciding what's best for the group. For example, in The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, the county government is wanting to put up high-tension electrical wires for the benefit of society, the group, the county as a whole. But one message in the show is that the government will take from individuals for the public good, even when the public doesn't want the good in question. Tell you confidentially, Mrs. Muir, lots of folks have heard about this and they're all on your side. The state's solution for this problem is to override the group just as it overrides the individual and make decisions the state deems are in the best interest of society. Here in the U.S., the Takings Clause of Amendment 5 to the Constitution states that in cases of eminent domain, when the government is seizing private land, the owner must be compensated for that land. Compensation has often been determined by a jury of the landowner's peers, and the right to a trial by jury is guaranteed in Amendment 7 of the Constitution. In the Spirit of the Law episode, Carolyn is arrested for interfering in a county project. At the hearing, the county is shown to be willing to pay just compensation for the land it's attempting to seize, even doubling the amount. But Captain Gregg pressures Claymore, who's acting as defense attorney, not to accept any compensation or any government seizure. Captain Gregg then provides a legal precedent, an earlier case involving similar issues. Aspersions, Uncle. What does it say? Right, let's find out. Schooner Bay County versus the Mansion House, 1842, Mrs. Muir. Now look at the last summation. 
esteemed magistrate. The last summation. Esteemed magistrate. Oh, I like that. Esteemed magistrate. That's cute. The use of legal precedent lets us know that the court is operating under the jurisdiction of common law. Based on the legal precedent, the judge rules in favor of Carolyn and Claymore, preventing the eminent domain seizure. The message here is clear. For the best outcome in cases of eminent domain, make sure you remain within the jurisdiction of common law. And there's a very good reason why common law jurisdiction is so important for the handling of eminent domain cases. This same reason is also why admiralty jurisdiction has been increasingly expanded many times over the last several centuries, allowing it to move well beyond its earlier limits. And that reason is this. Within the jurisdiction of admiralty, there is no right to a jury trial. It's only under the common law and civil law jurisdictions that the people are guaranteed their right to a jury trial. For evidence of this fact, we can cite the Genesee Chief v. Fitzhugh case of 1851, in which the Supreme Court found that it would be in the power of Congress to confer admiralty jurisdiction upon its courts and deny to the parties the trial by jury. More recently, Rule 9 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure has reiterated that in the suit in admiralty, there is no right to jury trial except as provided by statute. And in Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 71.1, pertaining to eminent domain, we find this. If a party has demanded a jury, the court may instead appoint a three-person commission to determine compensation because of the character, location, or quantity of the property to be condemned, or for other just reasons. A jury trial is considered an important right because historically people have felt that a group of their peers would be more fair in determining just compensation than a judge acting alone. Originally, juries were established to prevent court abuses. The second president of the United States, John Adams, wrote that representative government and trial by jury are the heart and lungs of liberty Without them, we have no fortification against being ridden like horses, fleeced like sheep, worked like cattle, and fed and clothed like swine and hogs. And Thomas Jefferson wrote the following to Thomas Paine. I consider the trial by jury as the only anchor ever yet imagined by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. Even our Declaration of Independence here in the U.S. cited the abuse perpetrated by King George III in depriving American colonists of the benefits of a trial by jury. It's the admiralty jurisdiction that allows the government to deny the people their constitutional right to a jury trial. But why would admiralty jurisdiction even be considered in a case involving someone's land. Wouldn't that qualify as the opposite of a jurisdiction of the sea? If we look more closely at the majority opinion in the 1851 Genesee Chief v. Fitzhugh case, we find this explanation. The judicial power in cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction has never been supposed to extend to contracts made on land and to be executed on land. But if the power of regulating commerce can be made the foundation of jurisdiction in its courts, and a new and extended admiralty jurisdiction beyond its heretofore known and admitted limits may be created on water under that authority, the same reason would justify the same exercise of power on land. So commerce is the crux and focal point of law relating to the sea, and the jurisdiction of admiralty is behind why the U.S. government in particular has been so intent on regulating commerce. 
The root morpheme of the word commerce is mer, the French word for sea. Why French? Historically, the law courts of England were documented in two languages. Latin was one, but the other was something known as law French, based on the legal terms used by William the Conqueror and the invading French Normans. Commerce was so closely tied to the sea because acquisition, whether through trading, piracy, or colonization, was the only thing that took place on the sea. Other commercial terms that have their roots in the context of the sea, or the French mer, are merchant, merchandise, mercantile, and mercantilism, an economic system I've discussed in previous videos. So when the federal government is regulating commerce, or more specifically, interstate or foreign commerce, it's regulating it as a sea-based activity, even on land. It's the sea, the water, that determines whether or not the commerce is true, regulatable commerce, an activity of the mayor. A clue regarding this is found in 33 CFR section 329.7, where we find this. A water body may be entirely within a state, yet still be capable of carrying interstate commerce. Over time, the U.S. has continually expanded admiralty jurisdiction to allow the government to have more admiralty power over the land. And this is why the captain is constantly pointing out to Carolyn that his sea-based perspective trumps her existence on land. This is a house. Well, you call it a house, I call it a ship, but let's not quarrel over words. It's not just words. One Claymore Gregg boarded my vessel without permission and attempted an act of piracy. Your vessel? You seem to forget, Captain, that this house and everything in it belongs to Claymore Gregg. Not while I am aboard. Well, you're not aboard. You've been dead for over a hundred years. Dead, but not departed. <laughs> As long as I stand on this quarterdeck, she is my ship. This recurring question regarding whether we operate under the jurisdiction of land or sea is fairly well answered in an episode of the show called Dig for the Truth. The title alone suggests that truth has been hidden from us underground, a very open-ended subject. But in this particular episode, Captain Gregg is seeking to prove that his ancestor founded the grammar school of Schooner Bay. He's unable to find the necessary documentation, so he forces Claymore to dig on the school grounds in search of the building's cornerstone. As he digs, the rotted foundation gives way, causing the building to shift and heave like a ship on the unsteady waves of the land beneath it. The wood in this foundation is all rotted. My shovel is stuck in it. Then pull it out, Thunderhead. Oh. Did you feel that? Didn't feel a thing. Felt like a tremor. Wouldn't you be more comfortable over here? <laughs> this room is tilting. Would anyone like a glass of water? <laughs> Why don't we go to another room? Like this, this whole foundation will give away. Mr. Hampton! Oh, fancy meeting you here. The metaphor is clear. The information and knowledge provided by centuries of schooling in America is based on a rotten foundation. And here we're shown that the land is the sea, or more precisely, that being on land is no protection from the violent foundational and jurisdictional waves of the sea. The jurisdiction of Admiralty has been expanding here in the U.S. for centuries, but as recently as 1948, Admiralty jurisdiction was again extended beyond its previous limits. The aptly named Admiralty Extension Act stated that the Admiralty and Maritime Jurisdiction of the United States shall extend to and include all cases of damage or injury to person or property caused by a vessel on navigable water 
notwithstanding that such damage or injury be done or consummated on land. So, you finally admit that you are lucky to be aboard my ship. Captain, ships are on water, houses are on land, and I'm standing on land. You are standing on my land, madam, and I am a man of the sea. Well, then why can't you tell water from land? <laughs>